Okay, so welcome, and uh, we'll start with the Heart Sutra to set our motivation. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of Vultures Mountain in Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared Tayata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. And so reconnecting with that, and relaxing your attention. Okay, so last week you did a review of the 12 links of dependent arising and um, 
because it's really important to understand dependent arising both in the everyday sense and in the past and future lives sense before we can have a lot of other conversations in Buddhism. I want to make sure that it is clear before we move on from it. So how did you go reviewing that topic? Did it remind you of the things that you learned with Venerable Amy? Any insights or questions you had about that topic from last semester? Did you want to um, share some things that you remembered were interesting or some things you remembered were confusing? In those Wednesday classes, it's useful if you um, can write down some questions, whether or not there's time for discussion, because then you can bring them to the next class and they're all kind of like sharp and clear in your mind. Um, so I know it's hard to be on the spot and have a question right off the tip of your tongue. But if on Wednesdays you can write down those things, then you can bring them to Mondays. Um, when we talk about breaking the links, what do you think about? What's a, what are ways to break negative habit patterns? For example, between when you have a suffering experience and it turning into a negative state of mind, how can you break that pattern? It doesn't have to be technical or fancy, just what do you say to yourself so that suffering doesn't turn into a disturbing emotion? I think maybe it's helpful to be with consciousness to the suffering and to let us to be with the suffering, not to ignore it, not to deny it, to let it you know, to, to be in all inside me. And maybe it's helped that it will not cause uh, for another to, what you said, I don't remember, to disturb, if, disturb uh, emotion. Yeah, like if you acknowledge it, then it doesn't leak. <laughs> you know, if you pretend it's not there, then it might leak out. Have you been with people who you can tell that they're suffering, but they're um, so identified with being strong and resilient that they say, no, I'm fine, no, I'm fine. And you're like, well, you're not fine. So can we talk about that, <laughs> you know, and they become really unbearable to be around because they're not honest with their situation. And they don't have to share it with you, but you can tell that they're not even sharing it with themselves. And it actually makes the suffering worse, doesn't it? And it makes it last longer. Because almost by denying it, you start to identify with it in a strange kind of contradiction. We're, we're strange creatures that way. It's almost like if you say, oh, wow, I've got a headache then you're not grumpy. <laughs> but if you say, I have a, um, I, I don't have a headache, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's not that bad, then you actually can start to get grumpy about it. For example, you know. I yeah. learned it uh, from a practicing from a Pema Chodron that she wrote that if you feel pain or something, let it to be all the space of your body. And you, if you need all the space of the room, okay. So be with it, and later something will change. And then I think she's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it's not, it's not the only method, but it's one of the really important methods is just acknowledge that it's there. What, what else? Tirsa, did you have something? Yeah, I, li I liked what you said, uh, to be a witness and not to be a judge. So I thought about uh, being a, a com compassionate witness um, to myself or to others and remembering uh, uh, it's not uh, permanent and doesn't have inherent existence. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I also um, I remember like what you said, I think, but it was like two semesters ago where you once gave a small example of, but it really worked for me, that in other circumstances, the same kind of situation is, is not the same kind of suffering. So I, I th sometimes think to myself, okay, so I'm having a bad day, this is a bad moment, but if I was like totally in love or if I, today probably would have been different. So it's not of its own, it doesn't have an inherent existence. It's not of its own self and I then, 
it gives me, it reminds me that I have the power to look at it differently, maybe, or to, I can't, I can't, no, I, not always I can put myself in the situation where it's not that, um, it's not that much of a suffering, but at least to know that it's not of its own self, but it's either I have some, um, I also can contribute to being more or less a, 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 of a suffering. It helps me also. I yeah. think the first semester you gave this example and it, I, I still use it. Oh, good. I'm glad because it, it is that thing of uh, we give things significance and then assume that they have that amount of significance. But, you know, you remember like when you're looking after small children and they hurt themselves and then they look at the grown up to see how bad was it? Like they're not crying immediately. They're like, was that bad? Should I cry? <laughs> and if the parents like, "Ooh, ouch, ouch, you know, kiss, 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 off you go. They're like, okay, it wasn't that bad. And they run off. <laughs> but if the parents like, oh no, <laughs> then the baby's like, oh no, <laughs> you know. So it doesn't have like self-existent significance. Yeah, which doesn't mean it's not there, but it's meaning and it's weight and it's space that it takes up isn't existing by itself, right? Yeah, that juncture is the key juncture, right? Between suffering, turning into like a mood, you know, turning into the whole mental atmosphere of your day. So to say a disturbing emotion or an affliction, it just means like a heavy mood where you don't have space from the suffering. You don't have any more objectivity with it. Your mental flexibility is gone. You know, you're not able to navigate within it. And because of the pain, you give yourself permission to behave badly. You know, maybe you would be never speaking to people a certain way, but because you're in pain, you give yourself permission and say, well, I'm suffering. I can be snappy. I can be blunt. I can be rude. I'm, I'm suffering. And you give yourself that permission you know, and it's human and we need to forgive other people when they're like that. But for us, if we can start to catch it and realize that suffering and the mood that comes with it are two different events, you know, and then we can take some power back. In the, what uh, we learned about the first arrow and the second arrow, it's connected to this. Are you talking about the 12 links? Mm hmm between ignorance and karma no no that if you have the first arrow and you begin to ask who threw it who did it so you are causing to yourself another pain oh okay it's connected yeah i'm not i'm not remembering this analogy but um i'm i think you're i'm going with you <laughs> i'm going with you it, it's basically just giving yourself power back and it's easier with physical suffering for some people and easier with mental suffering for other people. You know, there, there's mental suffering that can arise and then there's giving into it. And there's a difference. And I think we know this difference, but when we're in the mood of it, it, it sort of feels like you have to feel this way. Like you have no choice but to feel this way. But, you know, maybe a few hours before that, you did have choice before you fell into it. Yeah, and if we can kind of catch those windows where you feel some mental suffering arising, you know, fatigue or stress or sadness or irritability, but it's small, then you have a chance to not give into it. But once you've kind of let it taken over, it becomes very hard to talk yourself out of it. And maybe it's not even a good idea to talk yourself out of it. It's too late, it's happened, it's there, it's with you. Now it's damage control, right? Now you have to make sure that your heavy mood, your disturbing emotion doesn't turn into a negative action. So what do you say to yourself so that you don't um, <laughs> allow the fact that you do have a disturbing emotion turn into a negative karma? What, what sort of, what, you know, so you missed your first window of opportunity. How do you navigate that second window of opportunity so you don't hurt anyone or yourself? Yeah. First thing is I understand is, is to stop, to stop 
stop do, not acting, being, being uh, 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 not to, to stop your need to, to act, to create yeah. a space, to create an, maybe an inner space. Yeah, it's, it's uh, that illusion of urgency that I always talk about, right? That when you have a strong negative emotion, there's an illusion of urgency that says, I have to act from this place. It's very important that I do something right now. There's a right now pressure that comes with negative states of mind. And it's a lie. You know, do you have to have that conversation right now? <laughs> or would in a few hours after you have a meal and a nap and a glass of water be better? <laughs> you know, but the affliction says you have to do it now. You know that feeling? So it's just, as you said, give it some space. You know, if you can give it some space and not act, it's almost a positive action to not act. You know, now is not the time to say anything or do anything or write any emails or write any text messages. Now is the time to just be still and let it roll over, let it roll through like a wave. Cause it will finish, but the more you identify with it or, cling to justifying it, the more fuel you've given it and the longer it will stay. So if you say, it's only right that I feel this way because they did this and this and this and this and this, it keeps that state of mind longer. You know, you've just given it more food. And what's tricky is that your observations might be accurate. They maybe did do this and this wrong. They, this and this is very bad, but that's not the correlation you wanna be making. They're not the reason you feel this way. They're a condition, you know? So if, if you rob the negative state of mind of food, it will die a natural death. And then you won't act from that place. But yeah, there's, there's other techniques and thoughts and ways to approach that. What, what are some other thoughts that come to you? If you are in a terrible mood, but you don't want to act from that place, what do you do? I can, I try to take myself out of the situation. Try to get far away from the situation when I can. That improves. Yeah. Yeah. I guess uh, another question is when we don't <laughs> listen to that wisdom that we already know, what, what is it that gives us permission to act from that place? You know, when, when we actually give in to our negative emotion and then go on to speak from there or act from there, what justification do we give ourselves or do Is people in general? Yeah. Very strong feeling of righteousness. Mm. You are yeah. absolutely sure that you are right. And the whole truth is in your pocket. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, exactly that. If you're, if you're feeling that certain, you're probably wrong. <laughs> and that's so hard, isn't it? Like, just as a human being to realize that the more righteous you feel, probably the less correct you are. It's almost unfair, this trick. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what's difficult about this is that sometimes we've relied on that feeling of righteousness to correct injustice you know, or to address something like a toxic workplace or a difficult family dynamic. We've relied on that sense of like righteous in indignation or this is absolutely unacceptable to get us to finally say the thing that needed to be said. But because we're speaking from the affliction, it has less creativity and it has less flexibility and less listening to it, which means you're much more likely to start a drama or start a conflict rather than resolve an issue. And you still might wind up kind of resolving the issue, but there's like gonna be a big mess first, you know? And was that really necessary? You know, so if we can stop relying on that feeling of just being indignant of, oh, how dare they, I have to say something if we can stop relying on that to motivate us to speak, we're gonna really be a lot more effective, I think, in groups. 
And that is a hard kind of maturity to have because not a lot of people work on that as a project, you know? So if you're surrounded by people who are speaking from this righteous quote, anger, you know, you feel like you're the only one who's trying to be patient and that's not fair. Why am I always the patient one? But you really will add something to a group if you choose not to play that game. It's basic stuff, right? It's stuff you already knew, but we have to like keep bringing it to the forefront of our mind and remind ourselves because otherwise it doesn't stick, you know? And then you get to another, I don't know, chaotic family dinner and your drunk uncle says something racist and you just jump all over him rather than let's explore the roots of that ignorance, <laughs> you know, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts about that window? Venerable Amy yes. mentioned uh, the Tara Brax, uh, Tara Brax uh, rain meditation. Mm. Uh, recognize, allow, investigate, nurture. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good process. There's also one from jo Roshi Joan Halifax, maybe children shared it with you, venerable children, called the grace model, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, it's like a same kind of idea where first come to the body, ground yourself, check in with yourself, you know, assess, blah, 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 and then act. It's so common sense that it's somehow almost embarrassing to walk yourself through it as if you were a child or a teenager just learning how to communicate with other human beings, you know, you, and you're all psychologists already and then becoming psychoanalysts. So sometimes we have to work with our, I don't know, like sense of identity as being an introspective, integrated person and realize that just because we know better doesn't mean we do better all the time. And that's human and we don't have to be defensive or feel bad about it. Just remember this applies to me too, <laughs> you know? And that all the good work you do for your clients, this applies to me too. <laughs> and, um, and to try and not have that cringe of I should be better than this by now. Yeah, oh, it's not. I feel that I get sometimes confused because we're a psychoanalyst or like psychotherapists, especially because we're used to taking uh, our emotions very, very seriously. Yeah. And yeah. There it gets confusing. And, and I think just from, you know, spending time with a lot of psychotherapists, you know, over my lifetime and then with you guys, um, pretty much all of my family friends are psychologists, right? You know, this, my dad's a therapist, all his friends are therapists, you know, like it's a, you know, this is what we talk about a lot is um, aren't emotions important? They're a significant part of our experience. And Buddhism says, of course, they're important. Look at the 12 links. What is feeling represented by a guy with his arrow in his eye? That's feeling like it's, it's showing that it is so significant an experience that you couldn't ignore it. Just like you couldn't ignore an arrow if it was in your eye. <laughs> right? You remember the picture? Right? And so feeling is depicted as, yeah, it's significant, but that doesn't mean it's truth. And that's where we sometimes part ways with psychology. And sometimes maybe we don't, maybe then we come back together at the end. But we're saying that emotions and feelings are not wisdom. They are information though, and they are big experience. You know, they're dramatic, big experiences in our life. And they are telling us something about our reactivity and about our blockages and about our resistance. But that is different than saying they're wisdom or truth. You know, if I feel it, it must be true. It's, we, we already do know better than that. If we really thought that was the case, you know, we would always, I don't know, do whatever negative habit comes easily to us, 
we would always overeat or we would always over gossip or we would always overdo this and overdo that because we felt like it. <laughs> but we know that feelings are not truth and we already adjust. But then when we're kind of with people, it can be hard to, to name that what you're feeling is natural, but it doesn't mean that it's necessary. You know, what you're feeling is the result of habit patterns and, you know, previous experiences. So it's completely natural and normal and to be accept, expected and you're not bad because of it, but it doesn't mean it's giving you accurate information. And that's the big area of discussion. And I mean, would you agree generally in psychology, you wind up coming to that conclusion as well? You might say, listen to your emotions, but don't you kind of mean listen and then find that there might be pieces of wisdom in there, but really it's also just a lot of reactivity. Do you come to that similar conclusion or not? Um, I think that in, um, I found first about this um, way of um, taking emotions and reactivity, emotional and reactivity into consideration, but not as the uh, only uh, guidance. Mm. Um, in, um, in DBT, which is not psychoanalyst, but it's uh, an integrated uh, way of, of therapy. Uh, CBT? With, uh, DBT. Ah, what is this acronym? Um, dialectical um, behavioral uh, therapy. It was developed um, uh, through and from um, integrating um, Buddhist ideas with um, with therapy and uh, and behavioral and cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh, okay. One of those dangerous marriages. Yes. I, I don't think it's dangerous at all now that I'm, I'm when I hear you, I can see more and more. Uh, actually, the um, therapist who developed it, uh, she, uh, she, tried, she uh, rescued herself from a very, very deep hole um, via, with, with, with just uh, a lot of retreats and long uh, years in, 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 um, in, st in studying and practicing, but what he says, and I think it's it's a good way to uh, to think about in this point that emotions are uh, informative, um, and, but they are immediate and they are always in the present, and and the uh, and you always have to be mindful of your long term. Um, goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep your motivation clear. So it's true that now I'm super upset and raging, and I was hurt, and my boss did this, this, and this, and this. But it's also true. But my goals, my lot, and my long-term goals and values are also uh, real and true parts of me. So mm -hmm. it's not like just um, what. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I have, anyway, go on. <laughs> I have some objections, but you go on. I want to hear. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'll, I'll, yeah, if we have time, uh, if, if someday we'll have time, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll yeah, no, it. email, email me an article if you think there's a good, good article that explains it clearly, because it is interesting. I have, you can tell I have some resistance to these things, because over the years, I've seen a lot of different ways that, you know, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression, blah, blah, CBT, Buddhism hybrids are very well intentioned and sometimes quite effective, but sometimes are a big mess. And it's like two schools of thought that are neither of them perfectly understood and then mush them together. And then it's not elegant. Um, well, so, I have, uh, so I have some I'll, reactivity I'll you myself. And you'll, uh, and you'll, yeah, and you'll, check, and you'll check it for yourself and, and, and then you can decide. Yeah, no, I'm interested. Um, I'm interested, yeah. But I, I find it really, uh, um, it's not like I need to depress 
my emotions or yeah. ignored or 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 you know or belittled them but i have more important coordinates within myself that i want to guide myself uh, yeah. by yeah that sounds logic yeah. so so uh it's not that i need to you know not feel upset or not feel like the negative states of mind mm. um yeah. Yeah, and there, there's the difference between feeling it and believing what it says to be true, you know. And there's a difference between feeling it and holding it and having compassion for yourself because of it and deciding that it's true. There's a difference, you know. You can be totally compassionate towards yourself and really hold yourself with a lot of kindness and gentleness and go, oh, this is rough, this is rough, but it's not true. <laughs> You know, and you're not disassociating or dismissing your your moments, but you know what I notice Lou, that I think is not skillful, and I see it everywhere I go, which is there's this need to like name and frame every single moment of tension between people and process it and work it out and come to some conclusion about what it means for the dynamic, the relationship, humanity in general, society and going forward. And it's like, you know, sometimes moments of tension can just arise and then leave. <laughs> you don't actually have to talk about it. <laughs> it could just go. And, you know, if it's something that happens again and again, maybe talk about it. If it's something that happens largely, maybe talk about it. But a lot of things just pass if you let them. They're not truth. You don't have to like capture every moment of tension and explain it to yourself and explain it to each other. You know, because actually you can't unpack every piece of a single moment. Because what's happening in the moment is actually the result of the past. It's not about the moment feeling arises from past karma. If you don't believe in karma, you can say feeling in this moment is conditioned by your history. And you all agree with that, right? What you are experiencing right now is very much the result of your context and conditioning. Of course it is. And so you can't say, I'm feeling this because this is happening. It's like, no, if you had a different history, this happening would be a condition for a whole other set of feelings. Yeah. I, thought, I thought about if a parent says to his child, stop and count until 10 and breathe, so this can make a child mad. Or if you <laughs> say to a child, uh, you're angry because you're hungry, it's also, or I don't know, to a a teenager because you're before your period or it's also or it makes makes them mad so i don't know it's just an association yeah and you know and sometimes we can be simple and straightforward and say i'm grumpy because my blood sugar is low or i didn't sleep well and you can say that generally speaking you can say that to each other but as long as in the back of your mind, you know, that's not really the reason. That's a surface condition. You know, there's been a million times you haven't gotten enough sleep, but haven't felt identically this way. <laughs> you know, there's a million times your blood sugar has been not perfect, but you've had a different response. So if it was that thing, it would always be that thing. But yeah, you can be with your kids and say, oh, must be hungry. And that's quite true. Um, and it's good for them to start relating some of the big conditions, the habitual conditions to their experience. That's useful. But as we get older, if we can kind of go deeper and realize it was one of many things. And if you don't say it judgingly, but like you said, it now softly, it depends on the, on the way you say it. It's not yeah. the words only. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if in the background of everything is, it's completely normal that we react this way. We're not weird. We're not dramatically different than anyone else. We all have this set of assumptions. So there's no reason to identify with your mistaken projections. You have mistaken projections all of us do, you know, there's no reason to like feel particularly bad about that. It's not useful to, but this is the tricky thing also is that, um, 
you know, I notice also talking to my non-Buddhist friends more that um, I can sound harsh or blunt when that's not at all what I mean, because I'm not identified with my negative states of mind as much. So I might say something like, oh, I was thinking this the other day, and then I realized that that was stupid, so I stopped. And they're like, no, you're not stupid, no. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm not stupid. You know, but they're, they're kind of like, wow, that's a really harsh way of talking to yourself. Oh, Yintin, you're lovely. You know, I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> because I'm not identified with my mistakes. I just, you know, or less so anyway. It's like, yeah, that was a silly way of thinking. That was a mistaken way of approaching it. I really should not do that. And I don't have then the whole rest of the sentence, which is, therefore I'm inadequate, or therefore I'm bad, or therefore I'm stupid. I don't have that whole rest of the sentence. It's just, well, that was not the right thing to do. I should stop that. All right. <laughs> you know, it's a lot more just kind of matter of fact. Do you, do, you, do you feel the distinction, right? So then you can be quite blunt with yourself, and it doesn't feel like self-harm. It feels very practical, because you know your own potential. It's like, I am not my negative states of mind. I am not my mistakes. They live here and they can be cleared out. You know, it's like if you move into a new house with, um, you know, that's had many renovations and many problems with it, but you can tell it has good bones. You know, you're like, this is a good house. You know, it's got solid foundation, solid structures. But as time has gone by, there's been a lot of strange remodeling and the kitchen has strange tiles here and the bathroom has strange tiles there, but it's a good house. I just need to clean some bits off of it and patch it up differently, you know, but it's a good house, right? Even if these parts don't work well. It's not the fault of the house. It has good bones. I don't know if you say this in Israel about houses <laughs> having good bones, but you know, you know what I mean, right? Like this, the structure is fine, um, but then you know, strange things, strange things happen inside of it and get stuck in it, and they are not the house. They can be cleared out and renovated. I am a little bit confused. We are learn learning about the tenets, yes, about the different uh, Buddhist uh, Buddhism schools. So they think different about, they have a different view about the 12 links. Yeah, um, they have a different view about dependent arising as a concept generally. And then a lot of them agree about the 12 links in general. Um, but the main points where there's, we're going to start to separate is how they discuss the link of ignorance mostly. Yeah, mostly it's about the link of ignorance. Um, mainly, you know, the ignorance that is the root of samsara. So you remember there's many kinds of ignorance, but the ignorance that is the root of samsara, the different tenant schools have different ideas about. So we'll, we'll get into that once, once I feel like you guys are really clear about the stuff from the last semester, then, then we'll kind of go back to tenants itself. But I wanted to make sure that you weren't lost because the 12 links is really important. Can I ask you, I'm a bit confused, but what is the difference between the 12 links and the five aggregates? Which part of them are really very close, as I understand? The 12 links are like the process that the five aggregates go through. So what the five aggregates are basically the basis for labeling self. Yeah, so, you know, to make it short but not precise you could say the five aggregates are the self but that's not quite right you know they're the basis that we label self on okay so those five aggregates undergo an evolution and a devolution through the process of the 12 links so the 12 links is a process the five aggregates is the basis for labeling self so think of the 12 links as kind of like the journey or the developmental stages that you kind of <laughs> progress and digress and progress and digress. And, um, and it's kind of, you know, repetition compulsion stuff, but it doesn't have to be endless. It's just that it has been endless so far. Yeah. You intend, but yeah. becoming, becoming is... Uh, I don't remember what, uh, where is it in the order of things, but it's quite developed uh, in the, the cycle. Yes. And yes. in an advanced uh, point. Yes. So where, where 
in what sphere is all this, uh, do all the previous uh, stages happen? If the agro, if, if, um, I mean, if the, the, the person or the aggregate, I don't know, they appear in the world only in becoming, right? Or in birth, I don't know, some, I mean. There, that's that's gonna be the subject of Wednesday. Um, so I'm, I'm making charts for you. Um, but uh, becoming is where all of the stuff from the past is ripening for your next rebirth. So remember that the 12 links is not one life that there's many cycles of 12 links happening simultaneously. Yeah, so you have ignorance, karmic formation, consciousness, just those three. And that as a little bundle is planted on your mental continuum and hangs out there like sleeping or latent. And you're having many moments of ignorance leading to karmic formation, planting a seed on your causal consciousness, right? We're doing that all day that first three all the time. And so it's just kind of like, you know, ignorance, karmic formations, consciousness, bloop, ignorance, karmic formations, consciousness, bloop, little seeds going on your consciousness. Yeah, they don't have sound effects, but for me, they do. Um, just imagine, you know, little seeds getting planted. And, you know, then from, um, then, you know, that's a juncture, right? And then you have resultant consciousness, um, and that's at the time that's kind of actualized with the birth, et cetera, et cetera. So the way these different loops loop around each other um, is, is going to be Wednesday's topic. So remember that uh, two of the links are karma. One is karmic formations and one is becoming. Becoming is when that previous set is getting watered and is blossoming into the next rebirth. Look, it takes a little bit to get your head around it, but... You know, the key places that you want to be looking at is mainly feeling turning into craving, grasping, because craving and grasping is what waters becoming and turns it into the next rebirth. So if anytime we're having a feeling, not just at the time of death, but whenever we're having an experience of pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, if we don't keep assuming that that dictates our mood, you can feel pleasant without it turning into attachment. You can feel unpleasant without it turning into aversion. And you can feel neutrality without it turning into indifference. That those are separate things, but we usually glue them together as if they're the same. So that's the main thing to, to keep looking at. Yeah, is between feeling and craving and grasping. Don't let feeling tip into that. Feelings coming from the past, how you respond to it creates the future. So it takes a minimum of two lives to finish a cycle. Minimum of two lives to finish a cycle. So that will be Wednesday. But if you want to read ahead, that, that reading from Geshe Ludru from Calm Abiding and Special Insight um, that I emailed you last week, that the second half of that is about actualizing and actualized, projected and projected. The first half is like, the order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's the first half of that reading. The second half is then how that works out in terms of lifetimes. So if you want to read ahead, you can, but we'll go over that on, on Wednesday and um, hopefully it will become clearer then. Um, the, ne the, the part I wanted to make sure was really clear this week is that you know your opportunities to change the pattern. So the last part that we haven't talked about yet, um, but we talked about last week on the Wednesday pre-recorded class is once you have done the wrong thing, right? You have done the wrong thing. You acted from a negative state of mind and you said something unkind and critical or you did something unethical. It's happened too late. What do you do so that that doesn't turn into suffering? That juncture. You can talk in terms of, of Buddhism or talk in terms of just everyday life as you like. But when you make a big mistake, how do you prevent it from getting worse? You try to repair what you can or make amends uh, yeah. or I don't know, uh, try to purify yeah. uh, what you've done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and 
make a resolution not to to try your very best not to uh, do it again I guess yeah yeah exactly and then you know the key maybe point the, is, yeah. maybe yeah, the first step is to confess about it to know that you did it like to say yeah I did it yeah hundred percent yeah hundred percent that's the biggest piece Abigail sorry to acknowledge it and to take yeah. responsibility yeah yeah Absolutely. And that key feature of responsibility, not fault, not fault, <laughs> not identification, not identification. You know, it's like that was 100 percent the wrong thing to do. A million things came together for me to do it. I am not the only instrument or the only ingredient. However, <laughs> it was wrong and I was a part of that and I need to take responsibility. But I am not bad. All the other conditions are not bad. We're just confused babies stumbling around in the dark, knocking things over, you know? And that's the way to view it is that, you know, we don't want babies to stumble around and knock things over, but the fact that they do doesn't mean that they're bad. <laughs> they're just clumsy. They're babies. We are babies, you know? So we're just stumbling around in the dark. So we need to pick up the things that we broke, you know, and we need to fix them if we can, but not with identification. So regret and responsibility have nothing to do with guilt. And I know that I say this a lot, probably all of the other Buddhist teachers have said this a lot, but keep remembering that regret is not guilt. They're fundamentally different. Guilt is stagnating, regret is empowering. Guilt identifies with and thinks you need to punish yourself. If I feel bad, that makes up for having done bad. It's nonsense, right? Kick it out, it's, it's rubbish. Regret says a fault happened, that was a fault. I don't want to do faults because they don't help myself or others. They hurt myself and others. So I'll stop. <laughs> so I'll be more careful next time. You know, it's really fundamentally different. So it's so important that, that we hear that. And um, then if you can see regret in that way, it's much easier to have this kind of confessional mind that can say to yourself at least, if not to anyone else, that was the wrong thing and I shouldn't have done it. What drove me, what was kind of dictating my movements in that moment and to take a step back and say, okay, yep, this, this, and this, and this, and this, which are not excuses, which are not justification, but help me explain the pieces of the story. And so I can remember that it's dependent arising, right? That all the mistakes dependently arose and the results will continue unless I interrupt the momentum of them. So I need to do something to interrupt the momentum. Because if we make a mistake and we don't address it, then we just kind of have this hanging guilt, like a bag of rocks that we carry around. And then we're sort of embarrassed about it and defensive about it or ashamed of it and depressed about it, depending on our personality. And none of that is useful or changes the pattern um, you know, a lot of what people do is negotiation in their mind to keep doing the wrong, the wrong thing. You know, like, I know it's the wrong thing, but if I feel bad about it, then I can keep doing it, right? That's the payment for getting to do the wrong thing, if I keep feeling bad about it. Oh, I know I shouldn't gossip. I know I shouldn't be divisive or critical. I know I shouldn't be harsh with people, but I feel bad that I do it. So now I can continue. Yeah, it's nonsense, but it's kind of like the justification we do in our mind actually prevents change, doesn't it? Yeah, so what other kind of tools would you use to kind of prevent a mistake from turning into future suffering in whatever form? Kind of breaking that circuit. Mm. If I understand the main antidote relies on the first day in from the 12 links for, on the first link, right? Uh, meditating on emptiness. So to start uh, the whole uh, cycle again. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, you know, ideal. 
that's the ideal practice is like if you meditate on emptiness absolutely that purifies but only if you understand it which is why we have the four opponent powers and purification practice using like Vajrasattva or using Om Ahum or using body of light or whatever. We have these relative truth method practices because we don't really understand emptiness yet. But if we understood emptiness deeply, that's the quickest and most efficient purification, 100%, 100%. Because if we realized emptiness, we wouldn't keep doing the same mistakes just naturally. We wouldn't have to be super proactive about it. It would just naturally not happen because all of our mistakes come from a mistaken idea about the self and about phenomena and other people. So if we didn't have that mistake, we wouldn't make those mistakes. It makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just pop it on the screen just so you can have one more look. And um, if you have any more questions about the breaking the link section, let's talk about it now. And then next week will be about kind of how it all plays out in daily life and over several lifetimes. But these junctures, are they pretty clear to you guys? And just jump in if not, or anything you'd like to add. Yonten, can you please explain a bit about the, uh, how do you change the karmic formation once it's been uh, for, uh, in form? I mean, it's already in a, a form, right? Well, it's, it's subtle formation, right? It's karmic formation. So it's very, very subtle. It's the seed on your mental consciousness here. And then at becoming is when it gets germinated and watered. So it's like it's been planted on your consciousness, but it's sleeping. Here, it's starting to wake up, but it hasn't blossomed into birth yet. Yeah, so it's like on its way to becoming birth. 10 is on its way to becoming 11, but it's not quite there yet. So you have a tiny chance here before these wake up. <laughs> you know, so basically you have a chance to burn the seed before it's watered. Or you have a chance to burn it once it's just starting to get ready to sprout. You know, so it's been watered a little bit, but it hasn't quite burst through its little seed shell yet. You know, and there's two, two types of karma, right? The sleeping one and the starting to wake up one. So in either case, if you apply purification, either from the relative perspective or the ultimate perspective, you can make those seeds impotent. So they can't bear the fruit of suffering, you know? So you're basically just canceling their potentiality. Th those seeds still kind of hang out, reinforcing your appearance of inherent existence, but they can't make you coarsely suffer anymore once you've purified them. Yeah, hence purification being a big, a big practice in Buddhism. So it's, um, it's something that we give a lot of time to as our daily practice at the end of each day, we do purification. Um, and for people that like the idea of purification practice, but they don't want to do a kind of formal religious meditative thing, then even just to sit and reflect on your day and to think physically, verbally, and mentally, where did I go off my path? And how can I do slightly better tomorrow? Very gently, very practically, not overestimating your abilities, but you make a plan for the next day. And you say, tomorrow, when I'm talking to that one person that I always gossip with, I'm not going to gossip at least until lunch, because <laughs> that's like how long I can keep my mindfulness for. You know, you make it really practical, but you're starting to break the momentum of your bad habits. So you can just, you know, be sitting in your favorite armchair thinking, and then it's useful to then go to a rejoicing practice where you think physically, verbally, mentally, what was positive and productive and exactly what I want my path to be and kind of lift yourself up with those thoughts. So that's a good kind of end of the day reflection. You know, wisdom is built through hearing, reflection and meditation. If you don't want to do it as a meditation, do it as a reflection and it can be still really powerful. And then life doesn't just race by. You know, you kind of bookend each day, motivation, purification each day. And then that you don't kind of feel like life is racing away from you. 
I was thinking about listening to you today was very much like being a self object for our patients in the sense being there to help them break, not, not mm. telling them, but being there in the sense to help them put something, the conditions are different are arising and being there to break the links and give them a different opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you, you're holding the framework or the chart in your head, but you're not saying it. You're just holding the possibility of it. And just by you holding that, they kind of touch into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's good work y'all do. <laughs> it's very good work y'all do. And um, so we'll just do a, a dedication and um, think that all of the energy we put into these thoughts go to these aims. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, so um, if you guys want to start working on chapter one of A Praise to Dependent Arising, just gradually start working on it. Um, hopefully, if you can get it done by next Monday, that'd be great. But if you can at least get the first couple pages of chapter one in A Praise to Dependent Arising, it starts on page 16 in the hard copy and on page 14 in the PDF. And um, I put that down in the chat section if you want to have a look. And uh, so we'll see you Wednesday. Well, you'll see me Wednesday. I'll see you Monday. <laughs>